Well, good evening, and I'm delighted to be here to give this talk on science versus faith with a provocative question mark. And when I arrived uh, here just a few hours ago, um, I asked Father Stephen what are the concerns of students at the moment in the various institutions across London, educational institutions across London. Um, and as you know, Father Stephen's got to oversight a senior chaplain, so it's very, very generic, okay? But he said, um, well, they do worry a little bit about their work about their work and their deadlines and their exams and finding employment. Okay, so here's a little bit of advice here. When I started studying physics at the age of 18, I was in a very high-pressured environment, and I used to get worried as well, very quite frightened actually. And um, I made a, um, two resolutions which really kept my sanity. Um, one was I didn't work on Sundays. So I began to get used to the idea that between Saturday night and Monday morning, I would do no academic work. I would pray, go to Mass, go for a walk, Anything but not the academics. Uh, leave that to one side. That was brilliant. And second, to pray a little every day. And so I, to invest, and I did a cost-benefit analysis, and I discovered if I prayed, um, <laughs> God is very gentle to begin with, right? <laughs> with our um, selfish intentions. But I discovered my day was fruitful. And if I didn't pray, my day was fruitless. So just out of sheer self-interest, I start to pray each day, right? So, so there's a bit of advice. So then I asked Father Stephen, oh, is there anything else they're concerned about? Um, he said, well, occasionally they have been known to worry about their relationships a little bit. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but, um, uh, so advice here. Um, well, I don't think I've got much to uh, advise you about, except um, looking back on university life from a perspective of 30 years, um, uh, I, I would suggest it's very important to study. Use the time to study, because... Um, it won't necessarily make you more likes, but you, but you've got, you won't run out of things to talk about. So in your relationships, you have a lot more to talk about, and as the years go on, that will be very, very important. So, so invest in education, also for your relationships. Okay, so that's a little suggestion there. So then I asked Father Stephen, is there anything else they're concerned about? He said, well, defending the faith, because they do get challenged, and um, uh, very roughly, the groups uh, um, evangelicals. Um, they like, uh, they, I'm talking about groups who come at us as Catholics so the, the more um, uh, robust sort of evangelicals um, uh, increasingly Muslims and they're, tra and they're trained in apologetics so they're trained to ask questions of Catholics and they've got a little root list okay? so you need to be able to answer that and then also you get um, increasingly a, a aggressive secularists um, and that's mainly the sort of target audience I've got in mind, our secondary target audience, as I talk um, this evening. So it's about defending the faith, um, aggressive secularists. And what is the issue with science versus faith? Could you just summarise for me what, what is the issue? Why, is, why are we here? Why are you gathered here to listen to this talk and for us to have a discussion? Why do you think this is a big issue? Because uh, secularists say that uh, faith is just... Well, there's no rational base for it. There's no, there's no good reason to believe something that you don't have good evidence for, and it's basically superstition. Thank you. So, so there's a st standard line. Uh, this is all superstition, right? Um, is there anything specific as well that um, people often think about um, the Catholic faith and science? Do you ever get any other particular objections? Faith and miracles. Faith and miracles. Yes. Yes. Contradiction between Perceived contradiction, that's right. Yes, it's, um, and actually it starts very early. So I sometimes go to um, primary schools and ask the students at the, the top of the school, um, faith and science, and oh, they're, they're against one another. I thought, oh, that's very interesting. What, what does the word science mean? And they don't know. I said, well, that's very interesting. What, what does the word faith mean? They don't know that either. But they have learned that they're hostile. So the 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 the, tra the, the, the imprinting is getting on, is going on at a very early stage. I suspect the main culprit is television, uh, 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 various soap operas, Doctor Who. Uh, lots of, a lot of anti-Christian stuff in Doctor Who today. It's slipped into the agenda, it's slipped into the narratives now and again. Um, a friend of mine giving a talk at Oxford recently showed a clip from a, a cartoon called American Dad. American Dad, you heard of that? Yeah. Um, and uh, in this cartoon, a clip, just a few seconds, um, the characters go to this brave new world where it's all sort of gleaming and uh, everything's sort of hugely advanced. And they say, where are we? 
and uh, someone, else, someone says to them, well, we're in a parallel universe where Christianity never happened, and we've advanced so much further. That is slipped into the narrative of a cartoon. So, you've got to watch it. It's been, it we're not really against formal argument here. We're against little sound bites being slipped into the culture around us and it's having a big effect on people's minds. So we've got to know how to break the spell. So my approach, by the way, um, I've interpreted the talk in the following sense. Um, I've interpreted the title in the following sense. The faith is perceived as hostile to science and should be resisted by anyone holding a scientific world view. That's roughly how I'm interpreting the title you've given me, Father Stephen. Um, and so my aim is to diffuse the premise that there's hostility to science. That's my main uh, goal. As a stretch objective, I want to argue that there, are gap, that there are, in fact, grounds for holding that faith, particularly in the Christian sense of the word, is actually fruitful for science. I'll come on to the, what I think about that later. Um, I have to say that I could interpret the talk in other ways. I want to just briefly mention this. I have, I have given presentations in the past on what I call Cartesian science, the worldview that's dominated our imaginations uh, in recent centuries. And if that's treated as absolute, the worldview can be hostile to faith in humanity. Let me give you some examples. This is Francis Crick, a uh, very famous as one of the co-discoverers of the, or co-mappers of the DNA double helix. Um, now here's what he says you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice might have phrased it although she uh, didn't um, you're nothing but a pack of neurons you're nothing but you've got to look out for those um, uh, weasel words, nothing but because what, what they're doing is they're weaving a spell um, and saying, don't look outside the box of, uh, of the little world we've created for you. Uh, there's a more popular version of this. Uh, I found it a few years ago in Bloodhound Gang, The Bad Touch. Um, it was a popular song about, uh, gosh, getting on about 18 years ago or so. But there's a line, you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. There was another line after that, but I won't repeat it in polite company. But the point is, it's nothing buttery, nothing buttery. And that's weaving a spell on people's uh, consciousness. And it's like a prison of the mind. Everything is grasped cognitively through the lens of the representation. Uh, let me give you an example. So, Cartesianism. Named after Descartes. What was Descartes famous for saying? I think therefore I am. I think therefore I am. That's very good, very good. Uh, he also invented the Cartesian coordinate system. So if you've ever used graphs with X and Y, you're using the work of Descartes. But this says that there's actually something else going on here. So he's teaching us to divide the world into, to portray the world as a box within which things move, within which matter bashes into other bits of matter. And that's a narrative, a grand narrative, that's dominated people's imaginations. Um, it took the geni genius of Einstein to realise that's not the only way of looking at the reality, that light is more fundamental than space and time. But we're still really trapped inside Descartes' box. And that's how a lot of people think of the world. And then it becomes very hard to prove uh, issues of morality or, 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 or the subject or God and so on. Um, I won't go much more into this jailbreaking business until the end, but basically... Um, there's this spell woven over the mind, and often we need other people to help us to, to jailbreak us, helping us to know more and in no ways. In other words, get a life. Okay, so I want to go back a little bit to what I was doing before I studied uh, for the priesthood, and in fact I worked in business for seven years as well. But um, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be an astronaut. And unfortunately, there weren't many jobs for astronauts, so uh, in this country anyway. So I decided to study physics, because then I could study many other sciences later. And uh, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. But I got, I got to Oxford, and this was a time when, when, in Europe, we were very excited about particle physics. We'd become excited again a bit, because of what was the famous discovery... Uh, in particle physics in recent years. Anyone know? The Higgs boson. Right. Okay. And, we, we were, and I was hunting that with my, uh, my team back in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, we had an earlier machine called a Large Electron Positron Collider. And we did some, some fantastic work with it, although we didn't find the Higgs boson. 
However, while I was there, um, uh, a distant colleague of mine um, started to link physics documents together with something called hypertext. And that became the invention that's changed our lives. What, what is that invention? Anyone know? Worldwide web. The World Wide Web. Yeah, Anyone used the internet before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where it was done. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in the space of three months, the whole world changed. In fact, Bill Gates, uh, founder of Microsoft, is famous as saying, is famous uh, for remarking that the internet will never amount to anything. Because um, it caught everyone by surprise. Anyway, that was, that was the machine working on the large electron positron collider. And that was my PhD thesis. Those were electrons, those are the cousins of the electrons, and those are the even heavier cousins of the electrons, and we discovered that there were no more cousins. So, that's nice. So I wrote up and went home. But during that time, uh, I was very fascinated by the beauty of physics, the beauty of what goes on in the basement of reality. And there was something else that uh, mathematicians were becoming excited by at that time, which was fractals, and particularly the Mandelbrot set. I do recommend you go on YouTube, Google the Mandelbrot set. I'm always amazed by this. It's a shape. We, don't, we haven't invented it, we discover it. And it's there waiting for computers to map it. And it goes on forever, and it never repeats itself perfectly. It can be expanded infinitely. And um, I don't know how to get a, a formal proof of God's existence out of that, but possibly this is a formal proof of, of the existence of God's wallpaper. Okay. So, um, but there's, there's a lot of beauty in the basement of reality. Uh, and, and it's natural to have a religious response. Natural to use theological language even without a theological commitment. Okay, I now work at Oxford. Um, by the way, have you ever thought about the architecture of Oxford? What does it remind you of? A monastery. A monastery. Why is that? It's taught as a monastery. It, 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 well, like Franciscans and Dominicans, and then there were then there were colleges for secular clergy. Then uh, what 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 religion were all these people? Catholic. They were Catholic. <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> 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 And then we have some very nice Anglicans who preserve the buildings ever since, and built them. But uh, the point is, is that these were founded by Christians, particularly people with sacramental sensibilities. And um, it's our oldest university, and many others like it. So many people say, Richard, well, Richard, you heard of Richard Dawkins? He's a professor at Oxford. Who founded Oxford? <laughs> Catholics, right? You know, it's. Uh, it's <laughs> What's the church ever done for us? Look around you, Richard. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, science of faith. Checking the background. Sorry, fact, sorry, a bit of fact checking. Basic facts. Clearing the ground. Then a few distinctions. Then my more adventurous topic: What does faith do for science? And then um, I'll sum it all up with a parable of the Snow Queen, which have really it's got it all in a few in a few choice paragraphs. Okay. Science versus faith. You've got to know these facts, and they're fun. So I'm going to whip through these very quickly, just to check you've got some basic knowledge. So who is this gentleman? Excellent, 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 good. And, and who is this gentleman? Isn't he the one that around the, about the um, expanding universe or something? Yes. Yeah. It's, got, it's, it's also called, the expanding universe is also called the... Big Bang. Big Bang, right. Big Bang. Just checking. And what was his other profession? <laughs> and very good, he wore clericals, by the way, when he was when he was at these meetings. So I've been able to use this picture ever since. Now, can I just check? Did, did you know the priest invented the Big Bang Theory? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. That's great. Well, I've, I've given talks to three sets of head teachers of schools, two groups of Catholic head teachers, and almost none of them knew about this. Mm. There's a, and there's a survey in uh, Finland at the moment along the following lines. Do you believe that God created the universe or the Big Bang created the universe? It's, um, the narratives have been stolen from us. And I go into school, sometimes an intelligent sixth form will ask me, how can I be a priest and believe in the Big Bang? And I say, we invented it. <laughs> And how did, the, how did the Catholic Church react to the Big Bang Theory? Anyone know that? No one knows that too? Ah, oh, good, good, adding value, good. Okay, um, do you think they got angry? Did the Pope get angry? 
Did he persecute the mantra? Did he burn him at the stake? Well, I don't know whether uh, it's a persecution, but he was made a monsignor. And then... Um, <laughs> And then eventually head of the Pontifical Academy of Science, which may be carrying some sort of cross, but um, nevertheless, that doesn't sound like persecution to me. So, in fact, if anything, Pius XII, Pope Pius XII, was actually a little bit over-enthusiastic about the Big Bang. It got palmed out. It's fantastic, fantastic. Um, now, this time, we had the first atheist states uh, in the world, like the Soviet Union. How did they react to the Big Bang Theory? I think they were against it, weren't they? They were, yes, yes. Yes. In 1948, astronomers in the Soviet Union were urged to oppose the Big Bang Theory as it's promoting clericalism. <laughs> I'm astonished we don't know these facts. The BBC has never had a programme about the Lamantra, no, no proper series, as he deserves. Yes. Condemned in the Soviet Union, the world's first atheist state. And lots of others you just need to know about. So um, this is a very, uh, this is a rather um, timely one. Uh, the first American spacecraft reached the dwarf planet Ceres uh, in 2015, and that was discovered by Father Giuseppe Piazzi. Uh, Father Genetics, you know about him, I hope, Mendel. So stop, stop and think about the implications. Two of the most important theories of modern science are the Big Bang theory in cosmology and genetics um, in biology. And both are by the clergy. And a few others as well. Father Angelo Secchi, father of astrophysics. Now he, um, he invented a tool for splitting the light for star from stars into its colours. And once you do that, every star has its own um, thumbprint, you might say, which tells us what the star's made of. And for the first time in history, we could study stars as physical systems. That was possible because of this man's work, and he began to teach us about the evolution of stars as physical systems. Father Angelo Sacchi. A few others need to know about. Father Nicholas Stainer, Father Stratigraphy. Um, Father Boscovich, Father of Field Theory. This page looks like a modern physics textbook. Uh, it's, points, it's points in a field. So it's a very modern concept. Not just modern, it's a 20th century concept. Except this was in 1758. In Croatia, very famous. They, they put his uh, face on banknotes. But very few people to study him in this country. Uh, Father Renny Howey, Father Crystallography. Um, uh, gave us um, things like the quartz watch ultimately his brother was Valentin Howey the founder of the first school for the blind his most famous student was a man called Braille Father Nicholas Callum pioneered electronics um, now he was working at a seminary and he um, actually invented the largest battery in Europe at the time the Maynooth battery and um, also discovered a way for translating alternating current to direct current and vice versa um, later popularised by a company called Siemens um, women as early scientists now I get told what has the church done for women well again, look back at the history reclaim our history this is the first woman professor of mathematics uh, Maria Ignazi have you heard of Maria Ignazi? good, few, well learn the name if you don't so 1750 for, uh, appointed to the, to the uh, um, chair of natural, mathematics and natural philosophy at Bologna, and appointed by Pope Benedict XIV. Now, the first woman to, become, to get a PhD in the United States was not till um, 1886, uh, Winifred Merrill, it's nearly 150 years later. Um, and there were many other um, pioneering women in Catholic culture. The first woman to get a doctorate, Ellen Episcopia, and also um, women doctors back into the high Middle Ages. Um, and even actually there's a remnant of this today I remember going to CERN and thinking that the uh, um, male-female ratio is very different from northern Europe to southern Europe in terms of who, who's, who are the scientists who go to work at CERN and generally it's the southern Europeans who send more women um, world exploration the first scientific maps, I've got, to, I've got to ask you the key question here, when uh, Columbus sailed across the Atlantic, what was he afraid of? falling off the edge of the earth and where was he trying to get to? India, India. India. and so where, he, where did he sail? he sailed west where was he trying to get to? east so he must have a pretty robust theory about the shape of the earth, yes? what shape did Columbus think the earth was when he set out? round you wouldn't equip the, you wouldn't equip the equivalent of the Apollo moon missions 
and send the ships west into the unknown if you thought the earth was flat. Uh, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, you're the victim of a prejudiced story that was developed in the 19th century, part of the anti-medieval um, sort of uh, sound bites of the late 19th century. And they, uh, the story was, basically, in the Middle Ages, they were so stupid they thought the earth was flat. And you hear this, you see this. Um, Ex-President Obama mentioned it in the speech, for heaven's sake. Um, but no, not only, um, not only did uh, Columbus have a pretty robust view of the shape of the earth, um, but uh, really the, the Catholic countries launched all the major voyages of exploration. Marco Polo, uh, Prince Henry, the navigator, Bartholomew Diaz, Christopher Columbus, Magellan's expedition, the first global circumnavigation. And in doing so, also sent missionaries, uh, well, acted as bridges across cultures, Father Matteo Ricci in China. And this is the first scientific map, 1529. Um, I mean, you may make moral judgments about what they did at that time. I don't know. But what, it, what cannot be said is they weren't interested in exploration. They were very brave. They mapped the world. They gave us modern geography. And also time. It's an amazing number of cultures because of the time to go in a circle. And um, this is not stupid. Because if you watch the stars long enough, what you see are circles upon circles upon circles. But the problem is, if that is how you think of time, you never progress. You're basically trapped in, in eternal return. And there are whole civilizations that have lived by that for millennia. One of the very remarkable things about um, the story of the Jewish people, and then Christianity, and some of that's been borrowed by Islam, uh, is linear time. That time has a beginning, it is, uh, we're progressing towards a harvest. And that breaks the circle. And Christ is in the middle, B.C. and A.D. So um, the very idea of progress is linked to the idea of that concept of time. And we've also pioneered time in many other ways. We've been very good at keeping, history, uh, keeping the records for history. Say, be the venerable father of English history. We developed mechanical clocks. We gave the world its system for counting uh, the, ca for the, the correct calendar, the Gregorian calendar, very hard to measure the length of the solar year, but we finally achieved it um, in 1582. And then things like the astrono astronomical clock, which are then the forerunners of our ability to do experimental science today. The church and education. Uh, you know, this is an amazing achievement. Lindisfarne. We have 800 monasteries in this country, unfortunately, all destroyed in a few years under Henry VIII. And we had to start from scratch um, in this country. But 10% of children in England today are educated in Catholic schools. That's not bad in 150 years, um, starting from scratch, pretty much. Um, and there are many other schools, institutions that we founded that still exist. Uh, King's School, Canterbury, possibly the world's oldest school. And 50 universities in Europe by the time of the call fall of Constantinople. Bologna, Paris, Oxford, Salerno, Vicenza, Cambridge, Salamanca, Padua, Naples, many others. That's all Catholic. <coughs> I'm not, now I'm not saying this in order to boast. I don't, I'm not interested in boasting. I don't want you to boast. But I want you to have confidence in the fruitfulness of Catholic civilization uh, against the, the, the challenges that we are somehow useless, that we help people back, all this rubbish, right? You've got to know this stuff. And then going much further back, unfortunately in this country, many of our students, all they learn about monasteries is that they were dissolved. But if, um, if you go back several hundred years, they were keeping records and, manu and uh, manuscripts and so on. And we're giving people hope. Um, and C.S. Lewis, a great Anglican writer that Catholics can share and love, uh, in this life we write the title page of what we are to be in eternity. Um, that's a positive vision. That's a positive vision. It means we invest in institutions beyond our own lifetime. So a famous economist of the 20th century said, in the long run we're all dead. So let's ram ramp up the debt, right? Um, but Christians don't think like that or, or be careful thinking about it like that because here we write the title page of what we are to be in eternity and, and is atheism always a friend of science I, I'm very happy to be, to be told about the bad things Christianity has done over the years and we've heard about them many many times okay? uh, all I ask is that um, people who, who make these points consider the many good things as well the, the, the context of the fruitfulness of our civilization but I think very, it's very rare to turn the tables. Has atheism been a friend of science? And it's not as if atheism hasn't been tried. 
We've had um, 26 atheist countries in the last 100 years. Um, we've still got some. I mean, r- uh, rigorously atheist, North Korea is one example, uh, and China is officially still atheist, although Christianity is growing very fast in China. But how did they treat their scientists? Vavilov was murdered. He was a great supporter of uh, Mendel's genetics. Um, Sakharov, who built the Soviet hydrogen bombs, um, protested against the regime, went into internal exile. And in the Cultural Revolution of China at its height, any intellectual who was not working directly on the practical work of the party was regarded as an enemy of the people. Pure mathematicians were regarded as the enemies of the people. It was a, it was a massive, vicious attack on, uh, on the life of the mind, you might say. So no, there's, there's, a, there's a dark history there. So, drawing those points to a conclusion, um, uh, there should be no grounds for supposing a naive hostility to exist between faith and science. That's not to say we haven't had our family squabbles. We've had our family squabbles. Right? Um, but, you know, you have to say, taking the big, 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 big picture, at our culture, what we've, what we've tried to preserve, tried to teach in our institutions, has been enormously fruitful. Uh, in many ways. And the Galileo case, I don't want to go into this too much detail, but the Galileo case, I call it the Black Swan event, he died in his bed, his daughter became a nun. But is a weak conclusion the best we can offer, that faith and science are not incompatible? Is there a stronger causal connection between faith and fruitfulness? So, uh, hopefully, what I've already said will give you a few basic facts, and if you remember just one or two of those facts, that would already be very useful, I hope. But now I want to do a slightly more speculative uh, adventure, or lead you on a slightly more speculative adventure, and suggest that uh, faith does something for science. But first we need to make a few distinctions. So people mix up these terms, belief in God, religion, and faith. Now they overlap, but they're not the same. You can put, you can put um, all kinds of systems and ideologies um, at various stages in this, in this Venn diagram. You have belief in God. Greek philosophers talked about God a lot. They talked said God is good, God is perfect, God is eternal. Uh, you can have religion that's arguably without belief in God. And some people say Buddhism is a kind of atheist religion in that sense. And you've got the theological virtue of faith. So, so try, to make the, try to distinguish these terms because although they overlap, uh, they're not quite the same thing. It's steady. One of the most exciting things going to seminary was um, being taught philosophy for the first time. And I realised I was just a technological barbarian. I'd never been civilised, right? Um, I've, been, I've been smashing particles, but um, no one had told me about the history of Western thought. Thank you to the Catholic Church. It's like an ark, you know. And um, uh, what was interesting was to open the, the Greek philosophers and, and discover very sophisticated, subtle talk about God by people who never who never been part of the Judeo-Christian history of Revelation. And that's, that's amazing. Aristotle invented biology. He invented the principles of what now become the logic we use in our computer systems. And yet, they also talk about God as well. So clearly, clearly people who believe in God are not necessarily primitive, irrational and evil, as some would have you believe. Incidentally, I believe that you can't get rid of God, and this is one, you can see it almost by this heuristic. Um, if you ask the question why, and by the way, we also ask why um, by nature, even little children ask why. I discovered when I was 10 years old that, in, that, that uh, French children did the same. So we were, we were travelling to Lourdes, and this little French boy running around saying, Pourquoi, maman? Pourquoi, pourquoi? So I thought, <laughs> looking back in there, I thought, they do it in other languages. Um, <laughs> but children ask why. And if you ask why, you get an answer uh, uh, in terms of a small, small number of principles. And if you ask about those, you get a small number of principles. If you ask about those, you get a small number of principles. And the passage from knowledge to wisdom is an ever smaller number of, is the passage from a, to an ever smaller number of ever more powerful causes. Facts about the world are here, but the principles are on the right-hand side. Uh, facts about human life that's, uh, that, that comes under knowledge if you say all human beings seek happiness that's a philosophical principle as you are here for example and if you've got a funnel like that what's the next, what's the next obvious thing to, to, to ask about if that's the general pattern of human knowledge does it ever converge? does it ever converge? You see, God is whatever is at the end of that funnel. 
And, and the real question uh, is not really the existence of God, it's what God is. Many people who self identify as atheists do put something at the end of the funnel. You can read Richard Dawkins on the God Delusion. He'll say, you know, the latest, latest speculation is that there's, 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 a, there's a universe beyond our universe, and there's a multiverse, and it's, it's all powerful, and it's always been, it's always existed, and it creates everything else. And you're back to the unmoved mover, right? But you see, he would regard that as a more attractive explanation because um, uh, it's not necessarily contradict, contradicting God, by the way, but um, uh, for him, that's, that's an impersonal God which suits him better. I could talk more about this, so I, I won't. But just uh, the basic, uh, my favourite proof of the existence of God is the cosmological proof. Uh, basically, you need you need a first cause for the other causes to rest on it. Um, but I also I also call as a witness um, the following. And, and please don't give the answer if you've seen this before. But if you haven't seen this before, I encourage you to, uh, to look at these words. Millions of flowers on the earth tell of his love. Blue waves of the ocean sing of his work. He's the creator of happiness. What does that look like? What does that look like? Where would you see words like that? A psalm. A psalm. And, in fact, it is the North Korean <laughs> national anthem. <laughs> Now, in North Korea, you can't go to Mass. There's no Catholic church. There's one show church in the capital. We can't appoint a priest. So literally there's nowhere officially that you can hear Mass in North Korea. If you were to worship in public, you might well find not only yourself in the concentration camp, but your children and your grandchildren if you have them. It's a grim place. But what's happened to religion? It shifted. That's why I say you can't get rid of God. The question is what God is. And if you don't want the revealed God, Christian God of love who gave his life for us, you create a job vacancy. <laughs> right? I was gave this talk in Ireland recently. I said, you know, okay, some of you are sick of Catholicism. I said, well, you know, um, you've got to have something. You know? t t t t take a look at the options, right? You may, may, may well decide that um, it wasn't so bad after all. Okay. Religion and faith. Um, so, faith. The root virtue of a second person relationship to God by grace. I'd love to go into that. I can't. So, take it. So, what is, what is faith? Faith is... Um, but a wonderful um, sermon by John Henry Newman on faith. Because um, he asked, why, do we, why don't we just have love? Isn't love enough? And the problem is this. That the external world doesn't speak to us directly of God. Uh, or at least God's purpose. Doesn't give us the face of God. Um and um, love will quickly, quickly be extinguished in this world but God has given external revelation uh, to help us on our pilgrimage and the act of adhering to that is an act of faith and that's why we need faith as well as love so you might say that faith is the defender of love ok, so what does faith do for science? about 10 minutes or so? Oh, right. okay. ok, so what does faith do for science? this is now my more speculative part now, in the first part of the talk, what I was trying to emphasise is that there are no grounds for naive hostility against, between faith and science. You may want to go into some details, you may want to explore the family squabbles, but I don't think you can say it, that those, there are really grounds for naive hostility. Nevertheless, the challenge could be made that, OK, faith is not incompatible with science or vice versa, uh, clearly, because of these individuals. Um, but what does faith do for science? This is clearly something different. Uh, faith doesn't teach us about mathematical laws. It teaches us very few facts about the world we cannot find out for ourselves. So what does faith do? What is its value? And to some, as a quick way of, sh of um, answering this question, I want to give you a history of art in two minutes, starting with 1432, my favourite picture. This is the Van Eyck mystic lamb. And it's the most perfect symbolic representation of the kingdom of God that art has ever produced, in my uh, humble but correct opinion. And, um, <laughs> it's, and in, in this picture you see here, look at, look at the Christian symbols. You've got the Lamb of the Book of Revelation. You've got um, the angels gathered around. You've got the uh, jets of water representing the seven sacraments as a gateway uh, to the kingdom of heaven. You've got the individual saints with their personalities. It's a beautiful touch. We keep our, in this page, in this life, we write the title page of what we are to be in eternity. And you've got nature perfected. 
That, that phrase from Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, comes from the book of Revelation. And you see the wealth of nations there as well. So they got, uh, if you like, happiness. If you ask someone in the 15th century, what is happiness? They say, well, look at that. That's happiness. Now, look what happens next. Early 16th century, do you notice a change? This is St. Jerome. He's become much smaller relative to the landscape. And here you, you get the beginning of a shift in European consciousness. By the uh, 1569, that's Peter, uh, Peter Bruegel's The Harvesters, and there's a church, but you see the church in the background, it's almost vanished. And there you get the focuses on nature. In 1821, uh, Castle's The Hayway is the high point of English romantic painting, and it's certainly very beautiful, but I, I, I beg you to think for a moment what's missing. What's missing? Uh, what's missing is, if you like, the concretely given supernatural. Um, incarnation, sacraments, uh, saints, uh, Christian worship, and so on. All that's, all that's not there. The focus is on nature alone. So this is not denying God, but God is in the background. God is distant. And then, in 1890, um, Vincent van Gogh's Wheatfield with Crows... Um, here, look, the road isn't going anywhere and the vertical dimensions are beginning to collapse. And then um, Jackson Pollock's Enchanted Forest in 1947. Um, I don't want to make an aesthetic judgment. Uh, you, you can do that for yourself. Right? Actually, seriously, I don't want to get, make an aesthetic, uh, aesthetic judgment. People got very angry when I, I point, I, I suggest that we may have uh, an objective scale of values here. But, um, but nevertheless, I put it to you that as our theological commitment changes, our perception of the world is changing. And the general direction is towards disorder. And one way to think about this, a, lo a lovely book, I strongly recommend it, it's Ian McGilchrist, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. It's about a story of the man who's fascinated by the brain and why it's divided into two. And um, it's a 30-year journey. It's, a, it's one of those remarkable books published in the last a decade at least. And uh, it's almost as if, see, if, if the, uh, there does seem to be an asymmetry in most people. If the left hemisphere only is working, you only get half an image. If the right hemisphere is working, you get the whole image, but in less detail. But, but the right hemisphere, most people, gives us a sense of the whole. The left hemisphere is more for the detail. And um, uh, it's almost as if the loss of faith has led to a loss of the right hemisphere cognition of the world. We're very good at the detail, but we can't put the detail together properly, and that's, and that's the problem. Um, and this serves as a, as a launching off point for the whole topic of understanding, which fascinates me because philosophers, many of whom made careers out of studying knowledge, they completely ignore understanding. And if you look at the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, or the last time I looked anyway, there was no article on understanding. Tons of stuff on knowledge. And I always get suspicious of things that are completely ignored. So, um, but understanding, and, and this is overlaps with other areas of research today, uh, like gestalter perception in psychology, possibly the right hemisphere cognition to some extent, and then in special divine action, in, 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 in theology, the idea of illuminative inspiration. Um, one way we look at these topics today is looking at optical illusions. This was one that was made famous by uh, Wittgenstein. Um, who, sees a, who sees a rabbit in that picture? And who sees a duck? Okay. And who sees both? Okay, I don't know what that means, but anyway, it's... Um, <laughs> but, but, you, but you see that there is, there is a difference, isn't there? But I, I also put it to you that the pixels on, on the screen are not changing at all. So it's very useful for showing that the operation of understanding is not the same as the operation of um, uh, uh, mapping, you might say, or just seeing points on a screen. Um, so understanding is over and above, uh, if you like, data or facts. And in this particular illusion, two kinds of understandings are possible. In this kind of uh, illusion... There's no one understanding, so Escher's, one of Escher's famous pictures. You have to keep sh shifting understanding as you move around. So there's between facts and understanding. Um, understand, uh, facts are what we think, often think of as knowledge. There's stuff that can be called in books or computers. Understanding is your sense of the whole. It's very personal. I understand 
um, or you understand, um, but it's not sure. But a book doesn't understand that a book may record things, facts. Uh, understanding is communicated by metaphor, literary forms, narrative, poetry, parables, and non-literal proverbs, and so on. It's 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 incredibly important for breaking that that Cartesian spell. This is a definition of death. Uh, in a medical dictionary. The common law standard for determining death, the cessation of all vital functions, traditionally demonstrated by an absence of spontaneous respiratory and cardiac functions. That's, if you like, a scientific definition of death, and it's not wrong, but the danger is if you say that death is nothing but that. And understanding gives you a whole new set of dimensions. This is T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland, on uh, the burial of the dead. What are the branches that clutch? What branches? Sorry. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. Which is correct about death? Well, both. Yes. It's, you don't have to just say that's all there is about life. It's not just stuff moving in a box. You can measure on a screen. A lot more. Facts and understanding. And understanding comes into hard science. This is a very famous plot. Incredibly important in science. The distance of the bottom axis is um, uh, millions of light years. The vertical axis is um, velocity away from us. And each point is a galaxy. What do you see? What do you see? You see something that's happened in the past. Well, uh, you're jumping ahead a little bit, uh, but first of all, what do you see on... Is there a relationship between distance and velocity? You see a line. You see a line. You can... You can what, what is the, if you had to describe what you see in that graph what would you say is the general trend the further away the object is the farther away the farther it's, faster it's moving away from us do you know the implications of that what are the implications it's like spots on a balloon the whole universe is blowing up like a balloon and what's the further implication from that? If you run the clock backwards, altogether. So that, that plot is one of the proofs, if you like, along with many other things, for the Big Bang, which we talked about earlier. So what, what, um, what shape would you draw through those, those, those points? What shape would you draw through those points? I'm not trying to trick you out. I, I just want to... <laughs> a straight line, yes. But is that the best? Is that the best shape you could draw? <clears throat> you could take a pencil and you could connect every one of those points by a jagged line, and then you get all of them. But that's not what you do. You draw a straight line or something very close to a straight line. Why? Yes. Because of recognition that there's error in your measurements. Error in measurements, although I have to say, these are probably pretty accurate. So um, uh, there is a scatter in reality, but yes, there might be some error there as well. Thank you. Right, right. But what is the assumption behind drawing a straight line? Yes. If I was a pattern, and what is the assumption behind? Interpreting the universe in that way. No, you can approximate. You can approximate. And what is the assumption behind? <laughs> it's very simple. There's an order. There's an order. Thank you. There's order in the cosmos. There's a simple pattern, simple laws. And that comes from our philosophy, and I think our theology as well. <laughs> and we use it in hard science. We don't notice it because it's so much embedded in our consciousness now that we assume it's just the way everyone looks at the world but no there's a training that's gone on here ok I have to finish soon so let me just um, so my, my proposal for faith is that um, what do we do for science well what do we do generally for knowledge 
we don't give facts we do give a few facts mainly about faith but what we really do is, is provide the big picture the context within which facts are ordered and understood so faith helps form the right brain cognition of the world the framework within which fa- facts and reasoning can be organised and, and make sense and I fear that loss of faith is gradually fragmenting knowledge and even uh, though in science it's interesting in physics today we have a thousand times more physicists than in the 1920s but we are not as creative as we were in the 1920s Make, uh, though we're building new machines and spending a lot of money but there's more if there's a God who wants us to grow in understanding the parallel of human teaching suggests that the I-Thou relationship with God will accelerate our insights in other words a life of living faith will tend to be insightful just curious do you know any curious facts about the Nobel Prizes I mean, who wins the Nobel Prizes what's the best um, determinant in your background for winning a Nobel Prize do you want to say There's one tiny group of people who've won 170 Nobel Prizes in science and mathematics. The Jewish people. Do you find that awesome? I find that awesome. (laughs) The people who've got a covenant with God, I, thou, are always being creative in the world. Okay, so uh, I love to show this film as I set it up, so I hope you don't mind if I just do this. Okay, so um, I tried to boil all these ideas down to to a very short um, film. So let's see if this comes out. (coughs) Inspiration is important to every kind of human knowledge, art, and practical skill. But what is inspiration? Inspiration is a kind of insight with a sense of divine illumination. This experience is like a light shining in darkness, a shift to a new and higher perspective, or someone who is blind receiving sight. Like the pieces of a puzzle fitting together to create a coherent picture. Inspirations generate understanding, allowing us to see the things we already know fit together in a new way. But where do we find inspiration? Logic alone is not enough, but we do have some idea how to cultivate insight. In particular, teaching is the art of accelerating insights, of one person helping another person to understand. An inspiring teacher raises questions, offers hints, removes distractions, and suggests images that encourage insights. Conversely, the child, student, or disciple has the humility and trust to be drawn to new understanding. Good teaching is therefore inspirational and interpersonal. Like natural insight, purported supernatural inspiration is rarely about acquiring new facts, but new understanding. But do such divine inspirations happen? If so, the experience of human teaching suggests to us that a personal relationship to God will be a fruitful context for such inspirations to flourish. In this case, we will not be surprised to find that societies with a strong focus on sacred personal prayer, liturgies and stories will also generate rich and innovative senses of ordered wholes. Whether in the perception of the natural world, in art, music or society, this understanding it may be a relationship with a second person, human or divine, that can help us to escape cold, sterile and closed circles of thought, inspiring us to see reality in new ways. a video from something called the Special Divine Action Project which I was leading at Oxford for the last three years thanks to funding from the John Templeton Foundation and uh, it's one of our little videos you can actually see the rest of them on our YouTube channel ok very quickly finish so concluding parable the Snow Queen I spent a long time thinking about understanding and gestalt of perception and then suddenly a, a, a story I read when I was 8 years old um, made it all make sense and Hans Christian Andersen got there first the Snow Queen are you familiar with this story? 
Oh, you ought to be. It's fantastic. I think uh, there's, a, there's a film called Frozen, which is uh, a little bit like that. Anyway, although I don't trust Disney. Um, <laughs> But in the original story, there's a little boy called Kai who's got splinters in his eye and his heart, and the presence of which makes goodness and beauty invisible to him, makes his heart cold. He doesn't admire real flowers, but just the geometric beauty of snowflakes, each of which he claims is much more perfect and nicer than real flowers. And he soon meets the Snow Queen, and he boasts that he knows his multiplication tables, configure and fractions, knows the area and square miles of every country in Europe and its population. In other words, Kai boasts of its rationalistic and especially quantitative knowledge. It's the Cartesian knowledge, if you like. As Kai is making this boast, the Snow Queen carries him away to her palace, at the centre of which is a frozen lake that the Snow Queen describes as the mirror of reason. So there she is, uh, carrying little Kai away to her frozen palace, and there he's trapped, uh, blue with cold, but he doesn't know he's cold. And he's fascinated by these blocks of ice and fitting these blocks of ice together. And he's trying to make the word eternity, but he can never spell it. And, um, and without that he cannot leave the castle. Now the whole story is about his playmate, Gerda, who goes to rescue him. And after many adventures she enters the palace and she finally finds him and she embraces him but he's cold and he's looking down at these blocks block, 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 block and she, and she cries over him and eventually uh, the tears melt the, the splinter of ice in his eye and in his heart and suddenly he can see her and he can see where he is and recognise where he is and suddenly the puzzle solves, solves itself and he's able to walk out of the palace and this is a, a way in which, if we're trapped in sort of a, a frozen representation of the world, uh, often we need another person to help us break out of that. Why? Well, come back to what I said earlier. You should pray if you want to do well with your studies. Okay. Just finish off here. Of course, one of the most famous examples of this is Saint Paul being illuminated. Uh, with the light from heaven. So, um, lessons for new understanding. We also need other, other person to help us to understand. A good strategy can be to get out more, mix with people with knowledge of different fields, listen respectfully to those with different perspectives and expertise. And it's a big problem in modern academia. We've become very serious. We're churning out papers. We've lost the, we've lost the, uh, the sense of intellectual play. So it's very important to, to not forget the value of intellectual play in your studies. Somehow get that back. But if there's a God, let's take the, take the noetic version of Pascal's wager. If there's a God who desires to communicate understanding, such insights are going to arise principally in the context of practices that, folk that foster an I thou relationship to God. Such practices include divinely na revealed narratives of, of divine action, parables, liturgies, sacred art, and perhaps via harmonization on subliminal level, sacred music. Be careful what you listen to in your, in your eardrums. Um, not too much dum, 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 dum. the noetic variant of Pascal's wager that's, that's, that's the music of slaves and pyramids um, the noetic version of Pascal's wager engaging in such practices in the context of the life of grace um, such practices will also generate rich and innovative senses of ordered wholes whether the perception of the natural world in art, music or society above all one needs to pray Okay, and there we have a final image of this most remarkable building in Europe the Sagrada Familia which is gradually rising out of one of the most secular cities of Barcelona, uh, so most, one of the most secular cities of Europe, Barcelona. And it's an insane project. And it's amazing. And uh, it's still not finished. And it's beautiful, attracting people now from all over the world. And this is um, uh, to house the mass and the concretely given supernatural. And so the faith is still generating rich and innovative senses of ordered wholes today. Thank you very much indeed.